Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 193 for Monday, December 10th, 2018. folks and welcome to gig gab the podcast you know by for and about working musicians here in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton here in uh, where am i where am i dave i'm in los gatos california it's paul kent as far as you know you are that's right you know what i'll tell you what happened there and it's very relevant to everything we do your brain is not your friend if you if you once you go to your brain and you say to yourself i can do two things at once <laughs> you are definitely yeah no we are not capable of that like it no. it's no we trick ourselves but what we're what we can be good at and it requires actually uh learning as a skill but is spotlighting like switching from one thing to the next and being fully focused on the next thing once you left that one thing behind that is something we as humans can learn to do. It's also not natural, but um, but the the whole multitasking thing. No, 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 no. It's just, no, and that's no. you find yourself lying to yourself that you can accomplish this in music all the time, right? Yeah. You know, I can read, I can read the lyrics and acknowledge someone in the audience. I can, you know, it's just, it's just not going to happen. Man. No, it doesn't. It, and I think part of the reason perhaps that we musicians think that we can do this is that we are doing multiple things at once that seem like separate things, you know, looking at someone in the crowd, playing a song on our instrument, singing, right. All of those things. But the reality is that playing and singing thing, even though you learn it as two separate things, and then you work really hard to put it all together together, it becomes what we drummers call an in, an independence or an interdependence exercise, right? Where your body Absolutely. learns to do these two things that seem separate at the same time. And it's a coordinated little dance that your body does, but you are really in the moment. Try, um, I, this is one of the hardest things for me. Um, my, you know, I like to use my iPad on stage, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes I will like if if I have to switch between reading like music on it and the mixer app or something, that's fine. But as I've mentioned, I like to keep my iPad in inverted colors mode when I'm reading music so that it's uh, white text on black. That way it's actually easier for me to see usually. But also it doesn't like glow my face with with, you know, the, <laughs> the white glow from from the iPad, which is great. But when I switch to the mixer app, which is intended to be dark because it's supposed to be used, then then it looks really weird. And the way that, that you can go into like settings accessibility, this is where you set this up. But the way that you you sw that I easily turn it on and off is I triple click the home button. You have to do it very, very quickly. It is nearly impossible for me to triple click that home button while I'm playing something with my other hand and feet. Oh, gosh. Like it, it, if I can do it in time. Great. But uh, if there's no way to really like do it quickly enough in time or whatever, it's like, yeah, no, it's just not going to happen. It's just like, no, my body, technically my body's capable of doing this. Of course I can do this thing with this hand. I can do this other thing with this other hand, but simultaneously. Oh no, 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 no. The brain it's the says it it's not how it's going to be today, Dave. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> hey Dave. <laughs> <laughs> hey <psst>, Dave. <laughs> not today. Yeah. Hey Dave. So when we were uh, talking last week, you were making a big decision about this theater show. Did you ever figure out which way we were going to go on it? I did. Uh, you helped me. Thank you. Uh, you helped me see that it was not th that I already knew that it was not the right thing for me to, to, to stick with that particular gig with the changes that were sort of imposed. And, uh, and, and I, and the, and the thing that really hit me was if they had told me this same schedule in August, what would my answer have been? Right. Because you know, when you've got the the benefit of time, you know, you can you generally there's less stress thinking about, you know, oh, how can I fit this into my life? And the reality was I would have said the same thing, knowing what my December schedule is right now in August. Right. Because in August, I might not have had other things on my December schedule. Right. But I do now. So if I knew all the information that I know right now, three months ago or four months ago or whatever it was, I would have said I can't do that gig. Like you need more of me than, than I can give. And, and so I did, I called them and I said, no, um, the, the reality is I did not, I, I, um, 
we're really busy this time of year and I need my focus on the things that I need my focus on. We is your day job. We my is your day family. Job. Yeah. No, okay. well, family too, for sure. But, but day job, you know, we're in the, in the ad sales business. Um, most of our shows uh, target consumers. And so Q4 is a huge thing. And, and, and we're really sort of done with Q4 in terms of the planning and buying right now. But what we have going on is a lot of stuff for Q1. And so there's a lot of balls in the air and I really need my focus. So as I often say, I have to be ruthless with my time and I just needed to know like, yep, this is okay. I'm either doing this and it's going to be these six days and I'm done or I'm not doing this and fine. And uh, so I made the decision, well, it's not, it can't just be those six days. So now I, it's, it's no. And so I told them no. And I explained, I mean, it was, I was, I wasn't ruthless with my explanation. I was just ruthless with my decision. It sits. Yeah, and how did, what was the tone of the conversation? Uh, they were understanding, uh, disappointed, but, um, but understanding, I think they've found someone else that can do it. And, and I had sort of resigned myself to the, the potential reality that they would not be able to find someone else so quickly. And, uh, and that I, I might have to do it with, with a limited amount of rehearsal time and, and all of that, mm. and they would be unhappy and I would be unhappy, but you know, here's the reality of it. Um, but I think they found somebody else and, uh, and I might wind up having to sub one night of it, which I'm not sure how that's actually going to work. But, um, but obviously I'm available those nights cause I didn't book anything else, you know? So, um, so I think, so I think, I think I'll wind up subbing. I'll find out more this week, but, but it also turns out that I, I think the requirement has relaxed substantially from what they presented to me a week ago. Um, based on, you know, I got a, a nice note from one of the other musicians saying, Hey, you know, I realized I'm, I'm sorry that you can't do the gig. And you know, like the, 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 I was looking forward to playing with you again and that sort of thing. And I wrote him back and explained basically what I just said to you. And sure. he said, he said, Oh, well, you know, things have actually lightened up quite a bit. They realized that not that no one else could do this. And it was like, okay, well, that's fine. I, if they've assuming they found somebody else, they haven't called me to say like, Hey, what do you think? You know? So I think it, uh, uh, the ship has sailed and I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. I, I am, I am upset though, that I am not getting to play this particular show. I was very much looking forward to playing Hedwig, but, um, but you know, it's how things go. It's, it's, yep. yeah, it's fine. It's all good. The gift Ooh. of time. So the gift of time it. is a I good thing to give it. yourself, man. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yep. Yep. So, so I wanted to share with you, um, a, so thank, a few thank, thank you again. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but thank you again for talking through that with me last week. That was great. Oh, that was, that was kind of, kind of a cool conversation, yeah. you know, and actually just to put a bow on it, you know, that gift of time. So here's the deal. There's musicians who play because every penny puts food on their table, right. And mm -hmm. you cobble together a living and you make certain concessions. Absolutely. There's, there's musicians who, um, who have the luxury of picking and choosing. Um, right. And yeah, so, for sure, you know, I think one of the ways that you sustain a life in music in whichever boat you're in is, uh, you know, having certain standards, you know, even if you have to take just about everything, sure. What you put in your boat of, of the everything's to choose from matters. Right. So if you put into your, into your shopping cart, you know, gigs that will take advantage of you that makes for a hard life. Right. Yes. So if you, if you choose to work with theater shows or club owners, or, you know, I have, um, there's a couple of interesting gigs this time of year that I was offered. One is a strolling, strolling around the airport, singing, uh, Christmas carols play pays great. Okay. And it's only three hours, you know, so it's, you know, basically like a club sure. gig, yep. but you know, that that's just not my bag. And if I was to do that, um, I would, it might affect my relationship with music, right? So, right. you know, music is a sanctuary for me. Music is a safe haven for me. And I've, I've always been very, very cautious about it. I know people who music is my way that I, you know, feed my family. And so I look at it very abstractly and I will take whatever pays as long as, you know, there's, you know, everything is on the up and up and, you know, there's yeah. no harm being done to anybody. Right, a right. gig is a gig and money is a money and neither are right or wrong, but you know who you are, I guess is what the thing is. And so that's kind of what you did with your theater. You were like, well, you know, this is weird. They're moving the goalposts. Right. Um, on the surface, A, I don't really have the time to give them. 
B, the premise of moving the goalposts is a red flag, and that's going to make it unhappy. And I really don't really need to be unhappy in the month of December. That's right? that was, that, that, it was, that's exactly yes. If you missed last week's show, now you don't need to listen. <laughs> Paul summed it up very nicely. No, it's totally true. And you know, to your point about knowing and respecting your sort of the, the whichever relationship, whatever your relationship with music is, if it's something like you said that you know is is your gig that puts food on the table or is, you know, like uh, you and I have, uh, we have other things that put food on the table. So music is, is a thing that, um, that, that we have a different relationship with. I don't want to say it's any less of a commitment, but that is sort of the thing I want to highlight is I am well aware that because music is not the thing that primarily puts food on the table. I mean, there's times when the, you know, the, the money from a gig moves the needle in a way that actually is, it matters and it makes a difference. But uh, but I do have the luxury at times of saying, OK, whoa, I can walk away from the money for, on this one for other reasons. Right. That said, I am very aware that when I am on a gig and when I'm committed to a gig, there are other people committed to that gig as well. Assuming it's not Dave, the solo act, which it never has been. So, <laughs> y- you know, so that, that would be a different thing. But when there's other other folks on the gig, I know that my decision to say I'm bailing out, which is something I've so rarely done. I think that's why I was having so much trouble last week is I was actually bailing out on something that I had committed to, even though it changed. Right. I mean, and you helped help me kind of see that light. But I'm aware that, you know, if I cancel on a gig, let's say I cancel on a rock gig at three in the afternoon. Well, that probably means that four other guys can't go play that rock gig that night and yep. they lose money. And then we or whomever booked it loses uh it potentially you know loses some uh some respect of whoever booked them and all of that so I, I i know it probably goes without saying for anybody listening here but you know bear that in mind as you make these decisions because oftentimes especially if you're playing in a band your decision impacts everybody else especially when it's one like i like i made last week and i knew it would impact everybody else but you know, so this is a really much. useful transition. So um, what you're talking about is, you know, reputation mm-hmm. and, you know, kind of what we've talked about here for years is your personal brand. I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, the vibe at this musician's holiday happy hour that I hosted a couple sure. weeks ago. Because it was basically a little ecosystem of the musical community in my area getting together in one place. So, so <clears throat> let's see. This is the sixth year that I've done it. Yep. Um, the first year it was 15 close friends and we right. got together and it was just really a nice thing. I mean, like the light bulb went on, like this would never happen that we would all be in the same place at the same time. Most people are working any, some combination of us are working on any, on any given night. And, um, and so I did it. And the next year they invited a couple people and, and it probably doubled in size. And then, you know, maybe got up to about 50 or 60 people. And then three years ago, it started getting pretty big. And I took a Facebook invite and I said, it's for, I I invited musicians and sound people, roadies, lighting people and booking people. So we really was the music industry in my area. And um, the first year it was big. It was really interesting. It was really novel. There was a lot of joy there. And then, you know, events kind of have a a vibe to them. You know, you go to a lot of trade shows and conferences and, you know, yeah. all of a sudden something's big and people start saying, oh, it's too big. Right? <laughs> yeah, of course. You know? Of course. But it does. It but takes on a vibe of its, it. of its own that that is sort of out of the control of the person who started it at some level. Right. I mean, it it, it has its own life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so the vibe in the room here. So given, given the audience that I've told you is invited to this and, and I do a few things. I, I take a Facebook invite. That's really the only way that I communicate. Um, I invite people. I am very specific saying, please invite your bandmates. or your sound guy, your light guy, your booking person, your roadie, you know, those, those people are welcome. Please no fans. This is really a lot more fun. If it's just a bunch of musicians getting together to meet other musicians and to, you know, rekindle longstanding relationships. That's toast each other, you know, for another year of bringing music to the people is what I typically say. I like that. And uh, that premise is cool. Yeah. So I just want to talk a little bit about, about what that vibe is like. And again, I, I don't think every, every music scene is probably a little different, but, you know, kind of like across the country, every high school kind of has its, you know, chunks of similarities, right? Yep. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah, right, yeah. So, right. Yes. There, there's right. I, I totally get what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> all right. So, uh, 
one group that comes to this is um, I live in an area where there has been a great um, working musician scene for a long time. And a lot of those musicians are still quite active. So one of the groups that comes is um, people who have played music in this area since the seventies. Um, and it's really fun at this event because uh, many people in the room we're in different combinations of bands together. And this is a time where they actually reconnect. And that's really rewarding for me to see. And that's really cool to see people kind of like light up, tell old stories, you know, connect that way. I, I really think that's a pretty fun part of the thing that we're doing. Sure. So that, that long time scene, you know, a lot of them are A-lists now still, or were a list back in the day. And even that dynamic of, you know, I don't really play anymore, but I wanted to come by and see some friends. And, you know, that, that dynamic is pretty healthy. And that's kind of a cool thing. There's the booking people who, this is a, um, an interesting vibe for them. So a lot of the booking people have been working in this area is for a long time as well. Um, and they come to see old friends and, you know, support the music community. And, you know, th that's one good thing that this event does. It, it kind of puts a there there, kind of like when we did Macworld, right? Yeah. You know, it was a there there for a, an industry to get together and meet. And, you know, if you, if you subscribe to the idea that a rising tide lift all boats, you know, people talking, you know, Hey, I need a guitar player. Hey, you know, what'd you hear about that club? You know, all that type of stuff makes the industry better. And it rises, you know, make, makes the, the product that's out there better. And, sure. you know, ultimately, I believe, makes the scene better. So there's the booking people. And I'm going to get back to the booking people in a, in a few seconds. No, but this is, I get, the, I get it. This is like, this is good to have a, 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 a place where ostensibly you're behind the curtain. No one is overly pitching, just sharing and reminding each other that you're human beings, right? Which well, this is, is kind of my point is like, you know, the premises come and, and, you know, raise a toast. Yes. What I'm about to get to is that, that, that people see this invitation and they, they grok it in different ways. So, so, so let me, I'll continue on the, the other sure. groups come, you know, there's people who have been around the scene, have had bands that, you know, get some work, you know, do, do some stuff. Um, you know, I would I would say if you were to put a metric on breaking through as to how many fans you have, gigs you have, love you have, you know, they're in a they're in another group of still working their way through. Um, and then there's a bunch of new people who have have gotten in bands. And remember, you're invited to, you know, invite your invite your bandmates. So I invite all the musician friends that I have in the area. Um, some of them have started new bands and are picking new people to be in that band. And some of them have experience. Some of them don't have experience, but they all kind of come to this. There's a general love level. That's, that's really kind of cool. That, that really works. However, what happened this year was kind of interesting. There were a couple of people who came, uh, they'd heard about it in past years and they came and they said, Oh, this is a business mixer. I'm going to come and business mix. So oh. they, um, you know, kind of passed out cards very aggressively, pitched their gigs, um, you know, were a little aggressive on, with the, the people who were there who were booking people. And that, um, even it was, a, it was an incredible minority of people who took that. But here's the thing. They left a mark. And that mark is, um, you know, these people are, are, you know, be careful when they're around, you know, prepare yourself that it's going to be a little bit of a grind. You know, it, it, it's going to be a little bit more intense, uh, you know, and again, not bad people. I'm not I'm not condemning them. But what I'm saying is that they created an impression about their personal brand and their yeah. band's band brand. Yeah. And so I think the 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 wrap of all this is. Under, like everything, understand your audience. You know, it always is amazing to me, like there are Facebook pages that are professional networking pages that are for musicians. It never dawns on me to go to other musicians to try and get them to come to my show. That seems like the worst audience to try and get to your show. They're usually poor, so they're not going to drink a whole lot, right? Yeah. They probably are. They probably are. They're are working. Yeah. yeah, so yeah musicians don't so. generally go see other musicians. In fact... This is why you created the mixer so that you could actually hang <laughs> out with right. other musicians. Right? Like, like, exactly. Yeah. Huh. So, so, you know, coming to an event like this, you know, I could see uh, it's a, it's a, it's a matter of style. Mm. Like, Hey, who are you? Hey, I, I have was, a band that does this. I was just going to say, like, if I were to come to, to this event, 
I would certainly be attending well aware that someone I meet there is someone that either I might ask to play a gig with, you know, down the road, or they might ask me to play a gig with them down the road. Like I know that could happen. So my whole goal would be to show up and be Dave, the, the, the nice guy. And hopefully when I'm talking to somebody that might need a drummer in the future, hopefully while that's happening, someone else comes up and says, Oh, I'm glad you guys know each other or perhaps introduces us and says, Oh, Dave's a great drummer or whatever. Like that, that third party validation. If you can yeah. triangulate that while you're at one of these things, that's the best because it's very natural, assuming it's natural. You See, know, I would actually take that another step because I would say that the way that you would be like, you know, go up to someone and say, Hey, my name's Dave. Yeah. You know, who are you tell me about your band. <laughs> Uh, and then they'll eventually they'll say, tell me about you. You say, Hey, yeah, I'm a drummer. I'm yep. a drummer. I'm always looking for work. And you know, you, you know, th there's a way to do that on a one-on-one -on -one basis that you don't even need that triangulation. No, the triangulation is certainly effective and, and, uh, will, will kind of give more validity to who you are as totally. third party validation. But I think that there's a way, you know, and this is mm -hmm. not just music. This is any, just just this life. is any environment. Yeah, I mean, you go to a, even a social party, if you're the guy, you know, talking about yourself all the time, yeah. no one's going to want to talk to you. Right. Right. Yeah. If you, if you show go to up a business like, mixer, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the big man on the totem pole here. Aren't I great? Yeah. I mean, I, that that's great, but that's the message people leave with. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and that may not be the one you wanted to send. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So the net net of this is um, some of those people who have been around and I know a long time that, that loved it. They, they said, Hey, I got a little bit of a vibe that it's kind of changing a lot of new people this year. And like you said, I'm as an, you know, my background as an event person, I'm keenly aware of when you step forward and assert something to fix something. And when you step back and let things just cut out organically, yeah. you know, work themselves out. And, um, you know, I also know that the people are saying, well, it's not that not what it was. You know, yes. there's a lot of there, th those people would suffer from FOMO pretty you know, bad. Like if it was to happen and they weren't there, you, you know, they would be like, well, you know, what did I miss? Right. right so, right, you know, right. sometimes the best thing to do when you host these things is to just back off, kind of let it play out. I think next year what I would do is just say, hey, you know, reminder, everybody, this is just a friendly gathering of friends, you know. You know, certainly, you know, feel free to talk about, you know, what you're doing. But if you pitch too hard, you're probably not going to get the result that you think you're going to get in this audience. And maybe just kind of guide, guide people with that kind of direction. Not heavy handed, right? Just kind of right. back up and let it be. But um, yeah, that's the thing. You know, that if you, like I said, in, in the same way that there's kind of like groups, every high school across the country probably has similar types of stereotypical yes. chunks of people. Right? Yes, right. I would imagine every scene has got the, you know, the longstanding Kings of the Hill, you know, the cats that have earned their place and, and, uh, and do their thing. They've got, they've got the people who are, who are consistently middle of the road people, their yep. formula for moving their, their projects ahead. They're doing the same thing over and over again. And they're consistently getting to the same level and then petering out. Right. Yep. That's another type. Then there's the new people who are, I'm just happy to be here. Then there's the people who are like, well, this is the music industry. And in the music industry, you know, you have to be aggressive and pitch. And so I'm going to be that person. And, uh, and you, you have all those kind of, you know, things. Yeah. You're going to get all those things. I, yeah, I, I wonder you're far more seasoned at the event thing than me, but I wonder if it's like, is it worth, this is the first year that this has happened at a level where people have said something, I mean, could have happened in previous years, but perhaps, you know, far less. And the question I would have is, is it worth tainting the organic nature of this thing next year and, and, and saying, don't do this as opposed to see what happens. Does it, did, you know, was this an anomaly? Did it self-correct? Like, it's hard to say. I don't know. I don't know. The it is hard to say. I had one other weird issue that one person who's kind of an up and coming booking person, she's trying to represent, you know, artists. Yep. Um, she went hog wild and invited a ton of people, including a couple of fans. So, Ooh. you know, on Facebook, you can kind of see who invited who, right? right so I, right. I did, I sent her a what the heck note. I've been, you know, the only thing I've asked about this is, you know, let's keep it for musicians. And yeah. She was, you know, reasonably apologetic about it. But again, you know, in my mind now, you know, yes, it's probably a mistake, but I'm cautious about that person now. And that's what networking is. That's that whole thing about how your brand precedes you in all cases. And so, you know, if, if that person is sloppy, 
yeah. you know, with, with something as simple as this, would you want them to represent your group? That, you know, that, that's what would go through my mind. She might be an excellent booking person. I don't know anybody who uses her and I don't know sure. anything about it, but, sure. but you know, I, I now have an impression about, about that brand that says, Hey, be cautious here. Yep. You know, beware, you know, let's see what happens. So I guess the net net of this is, you know, it's like that old saying, if you have to ask how much it costs, you can't afford it. If you have to tell people how great you are, you probably aren't, right? Right. I, right. I think, For sure. I mean, again, there's a certain vibe, like Buddy was telling us, right? There's a certain vibe in different music scenes where, you know, that's what people do. They go, they beat their chest in the loudest guy and, you know, the heck with everybody else, but I'm going to make sure I get mine because that's a survival tactic, you know, in, a, in the business world. Yeah. I guess there's that as well. I don't know if that translates quite as well. Certainly not in the vibe that I noticed in our in my little scene here. So, you know, it, it stuck out. It it wasn't terribly well received, um, and it created an impression. And you know, a couple of conversations I had post the event, people were like, "What the heck was that?" Yeah, right. And so, you know, and I and I know the people that were doing it, and they're nice people, and and actually good musicians. And um, my interpretation is they were like, oh, this is a music scene mixer and this is what you do at a music scene mixer. And all I would say is hold that up to the light. You know, you know, your scene better than, than I, I do, but, yep. but hold that up to the light. What actually works? What is, what do you want people to think when they walk away from an interaction with you? That you're, that you're a competent guy, that you're, you know, you, you're driving your ship, that you have a tech, you know, and if you, even if you wanted to go up to the booking person, what would you do that's different than the 50 other people who are doing it wrong? And going up and saying, I'm the greatest thing in the world, book yeah. me. What would you do to, to stand out with this guy, right? Would you go and just say, hey, I know you're a booking person. I just wanted to introduce myself so you know who I am. Would it be cool if I called you next week? That might be 10 times more effective than beating your chest in front of him. Then, oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, if there was a booking person there that I had been trying to, well, here's the tactic I would take, right? I If I really were uh coming there and of the mindset of okay like i need to bring whatever i'm doing to the next level and i, I this is an opportunity right as opposed to just like cool i might meet some cool people and go have a drink right but this is an opportunity so what i would do is i would look at the the people that had rsvp'd ahead of time and like you know comb through that list and say all right is there anyone there that i want to make sure i you know i get to say hello to and then the first thing I would do is like friend him on Facebook. Yep. So many people. I, and it, and this is just, you know, the, 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 the things I've realized over time, especially being in the sales business, you know, so many people will just accept friend requests from anybody on Facebook. So it's like, okay, cool. Great. I can, I can friend you. Because more is better. Because more is better. Right. That's <laughs> great. Uh, and usually you can tell like if somebody is open to that or not based on the way they manage their profile. And the same is true of LinkedIn, right? But LinkedIn may or may not be as relevant in the, in the music scene as, as like Facebook is, but I, but I would certainly do this with LinkedIn for a corporate mixer too, is look up who's going to be there. Great. Okay. Now, not only do we already have this, like, you know, perhaps tenuous connection, but it's there. Now I can learn a little bit more about you. I can, you know, check stuff out. And, and maybe if I give it enough time, maybe I can follow along and, and react to one of their posts or something like in a, in a, in a, I don't want to say organic way because everything I've described is not, is anything but organic, but in a realistic way, like, you know, keeping an eye on things. Oh, they just posted this cool thing about, you know, their son that plays hockey. I, you know, great, fine. I can like say, Oh, cool. Glad you're having fun. Smart. You know, nice yep. job right now. When I go up to this person at the event, hope like the best case would be that I do such a good job prepping that they want to come up to me, but, I'm not that good. So, uh, you know, I go up to him and, I, hey, cool. I know she could plays hockey. That's such a cool thing. And talk about something that's completely foreign to anything else that's been discussed at the event and leave it there. Right. That's it. Then it's like, oh, because like FaceTime with people, not FaceTime on the freaking phone, but literal FaceTime with people <laughs> is is like the perfect way to, as I, I think I said it earlier in this episode, but I say it all the time. You remind each other that you're humans, right? If this is a person that's being pestered by a million people all the, all the time to get bookings or whatever, you need to differentiate yourself. And the best way to do that is to show them that you're not that person that's going to pester them, even though you're tell that you person what, that's going to pester them. Absolutely. Like, but I'll tell you what, here's the deal. That person, the booking person. Yes. They know this is the game. They know right. that everybody in the room wants, wants a gig, right? right? It's not, you know. Yeah, they're not blind so to this. 
<laughs> yeah, you're not you're not actually fooling them. No, <laughs> that that you're deceiving them that you don't want to talk about business. Correct. You're actually just taking a a, a better approach to opening the door. Like you know, That's you it. and I have both done sales for a million years. Sales yep. is about opening, not about closing. Right. You got it. That's right. You open the door, you can have a much more meaningful conversation. So that's why that first impression is just such an important thing. And, you know, some people, their personality is a hammer, you know? Yeah. And I, I, you know, I know, you know, people like that. And, you know, in, in our world, those people get a lot of things, you know, those who are determined to take first, they do win often. Yep. I don't know if they sleep. I mean, I don't know. (laughs) And again, to me, that's just as important, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. So fair. Yeah. Anyway, so that that's my little sermon on uh, on uh, networking and industry things and making a good impression. I got something else fun to talk to you about. I went with a bunch of buddies on Friday night to uh, see hey, a live hey, show. I, I want to. Well, okay, yeah, go ahead, take that. I, I want to talk about the gig I had on uh, on on Friday as well. But go ahead, yeah, you do your Friday. Yeah. All right. So my Friday night, we went up to the legendary Fillmore Auditorium in San nice. Francisco. Yeah. You know, world famous, you know, some of the greatest rock shows of all time, which is a really cool style place. It's about a 1300 per person theater. It's um huge open floor, a little bit of balcony seating, but mostly just a, you know, big open floor on the bottom. Sure. And uh, I saw little Steven and the disciples of soul. So little Steven, of course, is Springsteen's longtime side man, you know, guitar player, concierge, you know, was on the Sopranos and that type of stuff. Right. right. And, and uh, the show was freaking Awesome. I mean, you know, you, you go to those shows every once in a while and you go to a lot of shows, a lot, a lot more than I do. Um, I, I need my music to spiritually move me, not, not, not intellectually stimulate me. Does sure. that make sense? I, totally. Yeah, yeah. I don't even, course. I don't even need them to, to stimulate my, my desire to work on my chops more, you know, sure. like, like I've seen, like, I love Joe, Joe Bonamassa. That is that is as good as it gets with regards to rock and blues guitar playing. Sure. And I go see that and I do walk away saying, oh, but, you know, a little bit of that is beyond yes. uh, beyond the reach of my of my woodshed time. Right. Yep. However, this show was awesome. And, I, you know, here's the thing. Little Steven to me is incredible. He's like he's like the rock and roll every man. You know, he he does underground garage where he's you know very committed to keeping uh, you know, great, pure rock and roll alive. He, uh, this tour, he, um, teachers get into the show for free. So he does a seminar about rock and roll history. And his premise is that, you know, STEM is a good thing, but it STEM needs to be, needs to be steam and arts needs to be in it because arts thinkers are important in our huh. society moving forward. And he's very passionate about causes. And, you know, I think I, think I saw one of his, he didn't play, but I saw one of his, uh, things he did a an entire showcase one night at South by Southwest at a oh, club wow. where that was at the, the unfortunate part was I think perhaps because he wasn't playing and and there were people there that wanted to buy him drinks by the end of the night <laughs> things were a little sloppy when when uh, uh, Uncle Stevie got up on stage to introduce the funny. last band but but yeah I mean it was it was fine it was like okay well I mean he's had a little too much to drink whatever you know so this was happens. a fifteen yeah. piece band three uh, three gospel you know background singers, um, two keyboard players. He's one of the guitar players, plus another guitar player, percussionist, drums, five piece horn section. And it was a rock and soul review. They opened up with sweet soul music and then they kind of went through, you know, um, music that he's written over the years, including recently one cover. They did a Etta James blues is my business is a, is a cover. Oh, nice. Great freaking cover. The band was awesome. 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 Um, but the flow of the show is just so satisfying. I mean, you know, started at an 11 on a 10 scale and then stayed there for a couple songs and then so intelligently kind of brought down where he could kind of talk to the audience about his mission and what he's been doing in his life and, and uh, you know, what music means to him and, you know, these types of things. And then back up to an 11 and then a couple slow songs and up to a 15 and, yeah, and of course. Uh, you know, the, the flow of the show was just, so, and the energy, you know, remember it, he's got to be 70, right? The flow of the show was just, uh, it was, it was church, man. It was just, it's so moving. And uh, you know, the three uh, backup singers do not stop moving. I mean, it, it was a Motown show with them. It was just absolutely awesome. Um, they had one song 
one song that they they stretched real big and each of the horn players got a pretty long solo you know as the show built to the end the crescendo uh the all the horns came to the front of the stage and the whole 15 band piece band is kind of you know up front um there's humor there's sex there's there's um chops there's passion i mean it really was just a very very enjoyable thing and i didn't i was prepared to enjoy it but i wasn't prepared to know it was gonna be that fantastic and it was great he, you know and you know steven who's like one of the great rock and roll historians that there is he's got um uh, uh the guy who was a keyboard player for the young bloods um is one of his keyboard players oh, wow. right Wow. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. a connection, Lowell Levenger um, is a connection. And then uh, his uh, second to last song of the night, his first encore of the night, he brought out uh, Nick Gravenides from Electric Flag to sing um, a song, which was, you know, absolutely cool. He sang Groove and Is Easy. Oh, nice. and, um, so, yeah, I mean, it was just it was like this rock and roll history, transcending time, time machine, you know, what, what rock and roll can still do for people right here and right now and put in the hands of a real master, you know, what, what that is supposed to do, why it did it for so many people, why, why that energy woke so many people up in the fifties and sixties and, you know, created social causes and all that type of stuff. It was, it was really, really fantastic. It's, it's to me the way music should feel. So I, huh. I just wanted to share if I think he's coming to the end of the 2018 tour, but I think the group is doing pretty well. Now, remember, he's playing a 1300 seat theater with a 15 piece band and flying around, you know, in a decorated yeah. 727. I think, you know, some soprano money is funding this tour. Yeah. Right? Some, some soprano money, a little bit of E street band money, perhaps. Right. Yep. That's yeah. right. Yeah. 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 So it, so, and then add on top of that, that is that to some degree, this is a labor of love for him. Right. And he works his butt off and he sings his butt. He sings the whole show. He sings his butt off for two and a half hours. It was, it's really, That's you know, awesome. You're so, reminded what this is supposed to be like. Little Steven just turned 68 back in at the end of November. Uh, Got it. So I wanted to point that out, but I also wanted to point out, I like it, 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 not to detract from anything you said, but uh, you said, you know, you don't go to shows to learn or whatever. And then what you described was <laughs> everything you learned from essentially this masterclass in showmanship, right? Yes. And how absolutely. to put together a show. And I have no doubt that that will factor into, you know, your set list creation with the house rockers going forward and, you know, just all the little things you just pick up along the way. Yeah, absolutely. You're yeah. absolutely right. It, it, it was it was a, a masterclass in the transference of emotion you yeah. know, from, from great rock and roll, you know, to the soul of the listener. And, and uh, yeah, it did inspire me in that way. I got to say it. Yeah. Really, no, I'm, it's still, kinda, it's I'm still kind of walking three feet off the air. So yeah. it was great. So, so while you were doing this actually probably long before you were doing this, cause I'm three hours <laughs> ahead of you. And, uh, and I played an early acoustic gig. We played seven 30 to 10 30, which is great um, with, uh, with monkey fist. And this iteration of Monkey Fist was, of course, Johnny D on vocals and some guitar, because that's always part of Monkey Fist. And then Matt Langley, uh, or as we call him, Matty, playing guitar. And and Matty is, uh, he is a human jukebox. If if you mention a song to him, he will most likely already know it and be able to play it. And he just keeps the flow going. And, and the three of us play really well together. We sing well together. We trust each other and all of that. So we walked up on stage at uh, at, at 7.30 in this little pizza place at, at old real pizza. And, um, you know, I'm, I was playing my cajon, my pitch slap. So I was standing up as I always do for these acoustic cakes, which I really like. It makes it easier to sing and move around a little bit and just interact a little more. Um, and we did not walk off stage until 1035. And I can't, I've never done that with an acoustic gig. I've never done three hours straight with an acoustic gig. Um, I, you know, it reminded me and it, and it occasionally will happen with a with a full band gig, but it's a lot of material to have to cram in or to have to to fit in when you do three hours straight acoustic because mm. you generally don't have a lot of time for, you know, solos and, and vamping. Right. <laughs> you know, it's just singing and and Maddie took took some solos and stuff to stretch it out a little bit. Um, but it was a it was a it was a blissful grind is what I will say. Um, it never once felt like we needed to leave the stage. In fact, I, we sort of made the decision at about the 90 minute mark, which on a three hour gig, I like that, especially an acoustic gig, 
where they might expect you to do really it's just two sets you know if if you got a three hour block if it's a three and a half hour block then maybe you do three sets but with a three hour block i always like to do the the first set longer than the second um all else being equal because that way you're not you know finding yourself going back up for the second set and having that feel like a really long one so at about the 90 minute mark when we would have taken a break we all kind of looked at each other and based on the crowd and we had a good we had, the crowd was very interactive and engaged and it was like you know what like, let's just keep going. We're fine. Let's like, let's not stop. But like it was, that. it was a blast. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. That happens in my solo gig sometimes. It's just like the vibe is good and yep. we're, we're moving on and you know, you, you know, you have the material and you know, let's just keep, let's just keep the good times going. Those are good nights. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just keep the good times going because it, you, you know, you, we've all seen it where you take a break and some people leave and, and, and it, that can be okay. But, um, but if it's good and you don't need to leave the stage, then why bother? <laughs> Just keep on trucking. It's good. Keep and three hours, three hours is different than three and a half. I, I, um, I'm trying to think of the, the longest gig I played, I think was a four hour show that it's we long. did as with the clam bake in Rochester, New York. Um, it was again, so we have clubs here that are nine 30 to one 30. That's actually a pretty common time. Yeah. That's a Long night. Yeah. I think that's what this gig was. I think it was a, yeah. it was either a nine to one or a nine thirty to one thirty um with the clam bake. And and we just like there was we also realized there was nowhere for us to go. The place was overpacked with people and uh, so much so that they were bringing ice to the front of the stage to just pour on the people so that they could like <laughs> chill out. Yeah. There was one of those nights, exactly. But um The but, nice thing about doing yeah. those three hour gigs, doing a couple of them. Yeah. Two hour gigs or a walk in the park. Oh, I know. <laughs> I mean, it feels yeah. like they're over before they start. I, I, honestly, I feel that way about three hour gigs after I've done four hour ones. Because when we <laughs> when we play over the summer, a lot of the acoustic gigs we do are either three and a half or four. Uh, and, I have very rarely oh, do a four hour gig anymore. Man, it's just so long. Like you really got to think about how to pace yourself and how to pace the set too, so that you yeah. don't burn up good material and, and yeah. you know, all of that. So yeah, these three hour gigs, it was like, yeah, whatever, but we are, they, <laughs> they, the, another one has surfaced and much to all of our surprise, we're all available for this coming Friday night. So we're doing it again. This one's even an hour earlier. It's a six 30 to nine 30. And in our, our group text about the gig as it was coming together, Maddie and Maddie was really the one who, who sort of pushed the idea of, uh, uh, you know, why take a break? And, and we all were in agreement, but it was his idea. And, and uh, so he's like, but I don't know, guys. He's like, I really think we should take a break on this Friday's gig. It's like, I don't know why, why you guys just wanted to play all the way through like that. That was a lot of work. So, but it was fun. We, um, Trying to think, we played uh, we played Springsteen's Christmas song, the title of which escapes me at the moment. I don't know why. Santa Claus is coming to That's town. That's the one. Yep. Yeah. So that was fun. Somebody That's not a Springsteen song. I love that. Yeah. Somebody requested Springsteen, and we usually we have a couple of Springsteen tunes in the Monkey Fist set list. Um, but uh, but Maddie, you know, when Maddie heard Springsteen, he's like Springsteen. It's Christmas time, and already he's playing the chords, and it's like, oh, well, I know where we're going now. <laughs> but and that's sort of the fun part when you can get into that flow. Right. Where the songs just come, the set, flo the, the set flows, right? The set just moves from one song to the next. It doesn't feel like a chore to keep doing what you're doing. That's when, and that's, that's why, fun. that's why we didn't take a break because we, we all know it's certainly on stage. The three of us knew that if we take a break, we might come back up and the flow's gone. Like we, we might be, you know, choppy yes. going from one song to the next. Don't it's like the, the winnings. Don't mess with it. Yeah. yeah. You can relax when you get home. It's fine. It's only three right. hours. Just go. It's fine. It's One fine. of the guys who went to Little Steven on Friday night with me is a really well-known local musician, Colby mm -hmm. Pollard. Great voice, you know, great performer, really has done it all around here. And um, he came to my the Springsteen show that I did last uh, April. And he said, man, that was really fun. But how did you memorize all those words? And I was like, well, you know, that stuff I know. And maybe 20 other songs. Right. But everything other than that is like really <laughs> painful for me to, to learn. And we both agreed that once you um, once you commit lyrics to an iPad, your brain will refuse to memorize them. It yeah. knows that there's a safety net there and it will refuse to memorize them. And he actually said, you know, and here's the funny thing. I play solo gigs all along. I play, you know, the biggest hits uh, of the last 40 years. I mess up a, a lyric. You know how many people care or know? None, None. <laughs> not even one. No, nope. 
It's so true. And Kate, that's not, that is not universally true, but it is g- generically true enough that you can get away with it. I have had people come up and say, hey, you he know, yeah. yeah, like we, we, somebody kept requesting Beach Boys and it's like, yeah, so like, guys, you don't understand how hard that music actually yeah. is to do. But they kept on it. And so Maddie was like, all right, it, John pulled up the chords for fun, fun, fun. And uh, and and so Matt starts playing it. And it was like, OK, that's close enough. So I and I know the lyrics. So I just sang fun, fun, fun. I could not for the life of me remember the last verse. Like, the, you know, you knew all along now that like I'll never forget What'd it you now. Do? Uh, we just wrapped up the tune. It was fun. <laughs> you know, it was like, it was wait, a request. Wait, you're saying you didn't sing the last verse? No last you... verse. That's correct. Oh. <laughs> That's right. And and the person was like, well, that was pretty good, but you know, you didn't sing the last verse. I'm like, we did it off the cuff. Like you, and that's <laughs> it's a when, request, man. Yeah, and that's when it's like, look, we are willing to play your request, but you have to be willing to listen to what we play. Like this yeah. is, if you want us to play stuff we know, then we get to pick. But I it, always say when yeah. when I get requests, I say uh, the best requests are songs that I know, and the worst thing that can happen is I take one of your favorite songs and turn it into a song that you hate because I screwed it up so bad. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, and it is nice. Like this one woman came up to the st- – actually, her husband came up to the stage or the guy – actually, it's her husband. I know, we know these, this couple. He came up to the stage, and he's like, um, you know, my wife wants to hear Guns N' Roses. I'm like, okay, uh, any particular – Matt wasn't asking – actually fishing for a song, but he was fishing for like, do you want heavy Guns N' Roses? Do you want like sappy love song Guns N' Roses? You know, he was trying to narrow it down. It'd be a little interactive. Yeah. And she's like, oh, Sappy Lug song. You know, that um, that Every Rose song. And it was like, oh, so <laughs> Guns N Roses. that's actually poison. But yeah, I think we can pull that out. Now, this is a song that Matt, Johnny and I have probably done together a hundred times. You know, the harmonies are perfectly locked in. It like there's not a moment that isn't that we don't just know where the other guys are going, you know? And so I was like, ah, yeah, I think we can, let's see what we can do. And of course we nailed it. Cause, because of course, because it would have been on the set anyway. You know right. Yeah. yeah. And it was, and they were like, wow, that was great. And, and then of course they're like, cool. Do, play. You, do you play it up and say, we'll see if we can figure that one out. Even of if you course. know it. Already. Oh yeah. Thank you. The first gig that I did with Maddie was a, a full band gig. I was filling in for chafed at the time. And, uh, and it was actually two, two or three nights back to back or something. But it was, it was uh, uh, on a boat in New Hampshire. It was a docked boat. It was for bike week or something. So crazy crowds. Somebody comes up to the stage and asks Matt, hey, uh, you know, I've got one for you. Because we're in request mode all, already, right? You know, and I've never played with this guy. I don't even think I'd met him before. And, uh, and so, you know, we're, we're, we're playing and, and somebody's like, yeah, I bet you can't play Ice Cream Man by Van Halen. Now, as I've since learned, Maddie like spent the entirety of the 80s doing nothing but learning every guitar lick to every song that could possibly have been released, you know. And and so he's like, man, I don't know. And he's like messing around his guitar. And, I, you know, I didn't I had no idea. And and then he and the guy's like, you know, no, nah, I'll give you like 50 bucks if you can do it. And that's like, man, just, I don't know. And then finally, he just launches into it. And it was just perfect. The guy's like, man, you played me. And Matt's like, well, yeah, you know, <laughs> thankfully the, the, we knew the song well enough that we could come in on the hits and, and awesome. you know, yeah, it was great. But yeah, no, that's, that's showmanship, right? You got to be able to, to play that off. For yeah, sure. exactly. It, yeah. I think when we finished poison, the poison tune, I turned to the guys and I was like, you know, we should add that to the list. That was actually pretty good. <laughs> But that's when, you know, when you're in that, that flow, everything just kind of happens, not just the songs, but the banter and all of it. So it's, it's an important place to, to be. And a set list can help you. Uh, we did not have one on Friday, nor do I expect that we will have one this coming Friday. Um, most of the time with the, with the three of us in that configuration, that's okay. But there's nothing wrong. Even if the plan is to not follow the set list, having one can be can help you stay in that flow when the next thing doesn't immediately come to mind. It's like, just look at the list. Okay, great. We know what to do when we don't know what to do. It's already been decided like, Oh yeah, there's this song. Okay, great. You know, moving on. Um, So yeah. Anyway, that's um, I, I, I'm a big fan of set lists, even if only for that reason, so that you've got a safety net. Oh, I agree. Yeah. Absolutely. Because yeah. again, you can't do two things at once. So if your mind, right. it, you know, you may know a hundred, 200, 300 songs, 
whenever you are caught with your pants down, all of a sudden you forget that you know all 300 of them because your mind is, you know, so focusing on, you know, how can I not think about, you know, a song? So, you know, kind of bring this whole episode all the way around. Yeah. A little it's bit true. of preparation, the tools bit. that help you stay organized and on on point are always very helpful. Yep. I've seen fish shows and they're notorious for not following a set list, but they do narrow they down. Them. But well, kind of. They have a song list, that, song they've, list. that they've narrowed down for that gig. They actually have a whole process that they sort of go through for the day of the show where they just narrow down and narrow down. And they probably hit the stage with like 30 tunes. Now, it doesn't mean that if inspiration strikes and a, a song that's not part of those 30s is the right one to play can't be played like it definitely can. But they've narrowed it down to these 30 songs that every all four of them are aware of and ready to play, even if it's a tricky tune or something like somebody might say, oh, put that one off till tomorrow. So I have a chance to, you know, re- refresh my memory on that or whatever. But um, and but I've seen it where, you know, they'll be doing like a big rock ending at the end of a song or whatever. And Trey's kneeling down or not kneeling, but kind of bending over, looking at this song list that's on the floor in front of him like, oh, yeah. crap, I don't know what to play next. Oh, now I know, you know, and it's right there. So he, you know, he's got three seconds of dead air, which really isn't dead air because they've organized things so that it's never dead um, unless, unless they want it to be, you know. And um, so, yeah, it's it's important to have you got to know where you're going or at least know how to know where you're going. I guess that's yep. the trick. Yeah. Know how to know. Know how to know. Well, here we are again, man. Anything else for this week? No, that was fun. I'm glad I got to talk about little Steven. Yeah. I'm glad you got to talk about little Steven too. Yeah. That sounds like, um, I, it, I, I would, I would love to see him play in that kind of venue and, and, and setting that sounds awesome. So I'm I hope you look forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. Same. All right. Anything else? Any thoughts for next week to to share with our listeners? Or we just uh, off going? well, we're getting close to the holidays. Maybe we should do uh, our Santa list. Oh, what do I want Santa to bring me under the tree? Yes. Yeah. Oh, all right. Santa list next week. Send in your Santa list, folks. Find us at feedback at giggabpodcast.com or, you know, you can find us on Facebook if you go to giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook. Either place. But yeah, tell us what you're looking for from Santa this time of year. Should be fun stuff. You might get it if you're, uh, you know, always performing. Always performing. That's right. Even when you're not. Wait. Just, just All do right, it. See you next week.